Being a strength and conditioning professional requires constant pursuit of better knowledge, better methods, and better means. But what if there was a place where strength and conditioning coaches could learn from some of the most innovative practitioners in the world, such as Jeff Moyer, Lachlan Wilmot, William Wayland, James the Thinker Smith, and Kirwenham Flat. Well, you could find multiple lectures from each of these top level coaches and a few lectures and examples from yours truly as well, all in the Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is gonna bring you well over a hundred different lectures from some of the top practitioners in the world to be your one-stop shop for your continuing education and professional development. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASP today and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. That's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASPS to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. Welcome to this week's Eccentric Minute, brought to you by Eccentric. This week's Eccentric Minute is the K-Box Belt Squat. Belt squats are a great alternative for athletes who don't handle axial loads well, and a great auxiliary exercise for athletes who need to get a little bit more lower body strength work in. You may sacrifice a little bit of depth when it comes to using the belt with the K-Box, but the addition of that heavy eccentric overload really is a great trade-off. Go ahead, set the belt so that you can come all the way through at the top. Give the wheel a good spin and sit back. I really am a big proponent of having some place where you can hold on for your hands just as a safety mechanism. Push with your feet, keep your chest up, and drive all the way through. This is a great exercise that I'm sure you and your athletes will see great benefit from. I really hope you enjoyed this week's Eccentric Minute. Make sure you check them out at eccentric.com to find out everything you need about the K-Box and the K-Pulley. Vinny, thank you so much for spending the time with us today, bud. Appreciate you having me on. Yeah, man, I'm fired up. We got to catch up a little bit here before we got started here. But for the half of a human listening that doesn't know where you're at and, and who you are, let everybody know who Vinny is and how you got down there to the A, bud. So uh, you know, I'm at Georgia State University right now. I'm originally from Malden, Massachusetts, small town, small city, um, right outside of Boston. It's about literally a five minute drive from, from Charlestown. Um, you know, I, I started, I was actually going to school for finance, you know, you go into college and emig- two immigrant parents, you know, make, you got to make sure that you make some money. Um, you know, my parents struggled, uh, fought every day to kind of make sure that, you know, we got, you know, whatever we needed, um, in our house with my two older sisters, and, you know, my dad worked for the MBTA. If people don't know what that is, he basically, he fixed buses and cars his whole life. And my mom was a receptionist at, uh, at a hospital. My dad came here, I think when he was 18, um, him and my mom met and my mom came here, I believe when they moved here officially, I think she was like 24, 25. Um, uh, and you know, they just, you know, they found a way to make it work. And, you know, I'm definitely lucky enough to have, you know, both parents. I know that's that's a big thing with today where it's just, you know, you don't you don't see that as often. So, you know, that's something that no matter where we were financially, we still had, you know, the blessing of both our parents. But, you know, one of the things was, you know, go to college, you know, make as much money as you can. So you don't got to work these, you know, 14, 15 hour days. And, you know, I did, I did finance. I actually did an internship for two summers with Merrill Lynch. and Basically, they were going to offer me a job when I graduated in two years, and I was just going to keep working as an intern. And I liked math, so I was more of a financial analyst as opposed to an advisor, but I hated it, man. I, I just I didn't like putting on a suit. I didn't like being in a cubicle. I wanted to be around people. Um, I loved playing, so, and I, lo- I loved, and at that time, I was, you know, getting into strength and conditioning, but, you know, my high school coach was kind of one, one of the guys that, you know, put me on a little better path than I was heading on. And, you know, I transferred to UMass Amherst. And um, before that, actually, so I had met a guy in a, like a, a, a local pub and he worked for Mike Boyle. And I grew up with his younger sister and, you know, we, I, we knew who each other was, but she knew that was something I was interested in. So it goes by the name of Anthony Miranda, who actually has his own place um, in North Dakota with his wife, Monique Lamarall. And he was like, you know, come by the gym. 
you know, see if it's something that that you like. So I head in there, um, you know, city, you know, but it was actually funny because myself, Anthony, and Mike are all from Malden, Massachusetts. But I walk in, you know, stupid kid, backwards Boston hat. I got earrings in, you know, walking around. I'm kind of looking at everything, realizing how stupid I've been training and seeing how they were. And, you know, Mike looked at me and he was like, and, and uh, he was like, you know, we'd like to have you on. I think he kind of, he definitely gave me more of the benefit of the doubt, being that we were, we grew up in the same city, even though he's a, he's a couple years older than me. But he was like, yeah, he's like, we'd like you to come. He's like, you just got to do me one favor. Don't ever fucking come in here with a backwards hat and fucking earrings on again. And I was like, yeah, got you. And, and I was lucky enough to be one of, I think at that time, might have been like six interns. So I think I was the seventh and I was like a volunteer. Um, cause it had, the summer had already started and, you know, learned as much as I could, you know, picked as many, but there was a lot of great coaches at that time. Um, this was 2000, I want to say 2009, 2010. So it was coaches like Anthony Miranda were there. Um, Jamie Rodriguez, who's in the, who's in the, uh, NHL, um, Dave Rack, who's a farm, who's a farm system strength coach for the twins, I believe. Sam Dad, who works with a lot of fighters. Kyle Holland works with a lot of fighters. Nicole Rodriguez, uh, Kevin Carr, Brendan Rarick, Marco Sant. Like there was, we had a lot of coaches where like, if you were to talk about, this is now 10 years later, a little bit more than 10 years later. Actually, this is 10 years later. You know, all these coaches have been all over the world and then, you know, meeting guys like that, like uh, Devin McConnell had just started. Um, and, you know, there was, coaches that were in that area that it was just like I didn't realize at the time how how great it was um I just wanted to ask as many questions as possible and they were giving me so much insight that I didn't even know what to do with and then now actually looking back 10 years now 10 years later it's just how blessed I was to just be around those people and I went to UMass that year and I met one of my mentors Richard Hogan's who was with Calipari when they went to the national championship with Memphis um, he went with Coach Kellogg to UMass um, instead of going to Kentucky. And, you know, I, I, they were working out in the student rec. And he, uh, you know, I introduced myself, gave him my resume. It was like, literally, I saw him walking. I was like, I got to take advantage of this. And we talked, had me work out with the guys the next day, and then he let me volunteer. So I got to volunteer that year with, with men's basketball. And we had a great year, man. Um, I think it was like 24 wins, went to the semifinals of the NIT, lost to Stanford. Um, Ray Lewis gives, gives a damn halftime speech where you can YouTube it to Stanford. And we were winning the whole game, and we ended up losing that game in literally the final minute. But uh, Wars, you know, I think my first college, like Division One college basketball experience was the A-10. And it's just, you know, for those that are listening that don't really – that's great basketball. Like, it ain't, like people talk about power five. When you talk about A-10, and then I was just in the American, and American's another one, and the Sun Belt, you know, I've only had a couple games, but, you know, guys kind of grind there. But the A-10 was my first Division One in-person college basketball experience, and those those were some wars. You know, St. Bonnie's had a really good team that year. Uh, you know, St. Joseph's, St. Joseph's is always a tough place to play. URI was good. You guys had a, you guys always have a dynamic, you know, little guard who just knows how to run the show, knows how to score. But, you know, I was lucky enough to work with Coach Hogan's for that year. And um, I was going to stay, but, you know, we had some things going on back home. So I decided to move back home. I worked at Boyles again. He hired me full time, but needed a little bit more money. And I got a second job working at an all women's gym. And back bay, you know, high end clientele. And I, you know, worked at a bunch of bars, you know, all over the all over the city. And, you know, I think that's why sometimes like we I think recently there's been a lot of talk about, you know, the paid internships or do we do paid internships? And you know, I to me, interns get paid. You get paid by not with, with the stuff that you don't know and what you're gonna learn. You can either work work for it and learn it because you haven't earned a right to get paid to do this job yet. Cause you don't know what it is you're doing. Um, or you can pay the, you know, this certifications that are, you know, a thousand dollars, $1,300, 15, two grand. You can learn a system 
but it's not in person. And I think that's why, you know, I think when it comes to an internship and I was full-time, like I was full-time at Boyles. I was full-time at another personal training gym. And then I worked at three different nightclubs just to kind of pay, pay bills and help out. But that's part, I mean, part of what we do is figuring things out. Like just you got to figure out a, a way to do it. So when it comes to an internship, like, you got to know, like, this is something that's going to invest your time in five, 10, 15 years down the road. And, you know, Boyles gave me my first shot at strength and conditioning because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was training like a normal college kid, you know, chest back Monday, legs Tuesday, off Wednesday, shoulders, legs, you know, that's, that's how I was training. And, you know, going there and have my eyes open. You know, that to me is like, you, you can't put a price on that. And when I hear this, you know, interns should get paid. It's like, well, hold on. Like they are getting paid. They're, they're, they're getting knowledge. They're getting wealth. And one of the things was, you know, I was, I went to one of the first um, high, high performances on the West coast and we had, and that's where I met probably the biggest influence for me um, as a coach growing up as, as, as a, as a person in this field, and, you know, besides my father and uh, my high school coach has had a really big impact on how I handle situations. And I've never worked for the man ever. We've just, you know, I met him at that conference. We've kept in contact my entire career. Whenever I have an issue or something that I need to work with when it comes to, you know, how to deal with a situation in this field, he's the first person I call, um, whether it's, it's either him or it's going to be Mike. And that's Charlie Melton. And Charlie's... That's my guy. If, if people haven't really gotten a chance to reach out, he doesn't put out a lot of content when it comes to our field, but he puts out a lot of, you know, content about yourself and, you know, how you kind of grow. And he's always up to kind of talk, talk, talk through things. And I went to that conference and I had met him, but, you know, we were talking about stuff I was doing at Boyles and some other people in the country have, weren't doing. And it was like, oh, wow. I'm like, well, I'm only 23. And some of these concepts that I learned from Mike, like it hasn't kind of branched out yet. And, you know, now you fast forward 10 years later and there's, you know, there's some concepts, there's a lot of concepts that Mike was doing that has now branched across even more um, to a lot of people. But, you know, being able to learn all that stuff at a young age where a lot of people don't really get that opportunity through an internship to me is huge. So it's like when you're when you want to get into this field, like, would it be nice to get paid? No doubt. But you also have to put yourself in a position that if you're going to take an internship, sometimes not getting paid and working for Coach A or getting some type of pay and working for Coach B, sometimes you want to learn a little bit more from Coach A. Because to me, like working for Mike, yes, it was unpaid. But I got to learn from Coach Boyle, who is, you know, one of the grandfathers of, of this industry. He's one of the first, you know, college strength coaches. He's a, he's a great person. You know, he has his he has his tweaks just like everybody else. But as a as an individual, as a coach, as knowledge, you know, he's always down to talk to to talk, and you're you're gonna learn from him when you're an intern there. And then the coaches that he had there, like like had we had just talked about, you're talking 10 years later, all those coaches are either, they have their own business. Uh, they work in the college sector. They work in the pro sector. You know, they all are doing something impactful. So you're not going to, so you're going to learn from high, high quality people when you do an internship program. So you're getting paid and you're learning. The hope is that you're learning from more than one person. Um, Mike has the, the philosophy, but Learning from Anthony, from Kevin, from Brendan, from Sandad, from Nicole Rodriguez, from all those coaches in that area, you still get little bits and pieces of other things and you just kind of develop your philosophy and develop what it is that you believe in. So when we talk about, you know, having a paid internship, it's like yeah, that, that, yes, that, that would be great. Everybody wants to get paid, but you are. And knowledge is one of the biggest things. And if you don't invest in yourself, you're not going to make money later. That's the whole point of college is to invest money in yourself so that five, 10 years down the road, you make money. Well, when you're an internship and you don't know, you don't have practical experience, you have to invest 
in that in that industry so that you can make more money down the road and then you continue to apply to to apply that continuing education and keep learning and you know that's just to me that's why I always think it's crazy that people want to get paid for an for, for an internship program. I just think it's nuts because you you are you're, you're learning. Now you have to find other means. But I was a full time strength coach at Boyles. I was a full time personal trainer, and then I worked at bars. So I basically had three to four to five jobs. But that's just that that that's just the life that honestly, if you choose it, until you earn the right to hey say hey I got one job, even though I don't think any strength coach, you're, you've been in this field for 20, 30 years. This is another job. You're really good at what you do and you educate people on this platform. Like, I don't think there's a strength, there's not that many strength coaches that have one job, that aren't doing something on the side, whether it's public speaking, workshops, podcasts, writing, like you have to make yourself versed in so many different things because at the end of the day, we are a field that is, you know, it's a luxury. It is, it is a luxury. And then, you know, I was lucky enough. Um, I did an internship with uh, Boston University with Glenn Harris, who's still there. And then the basketball strength coach at that time was Dan Sanzo, who's now at Northeastern. Um, he ended up leaving to go to Northeastern. And Coach Harris and Coach Jones, you know, t- took a chance on me. I had no certification. Um, I worked at Boyles. I worked at UMass as an internship. I did some volunteer work with USA Women's Hockey, but uh, with USA Women's Hockey developmental camps, but nothing in college. And they took a chance on me. And, you know, I'm forever grateful for those two guys, for Drew Maricola, the the AD, for taking a shot at me because I was 23 years old and I couldn't have been any happier. And I was there for four years and I fell into the trap that I think, at least I hope some a lot of coaches do, but I felt like I needed to prove myself to this field. And I feel like the only way to do that is you got to go to a high major school and you got to win at a high major level and this and that. And so, uh, but I was still lucky. You know, I got a I got an opportunity to work with uh, Coach Jeff Connors at East Carolina, and you know it's it had its it had its ups and downs um coach connor's gave me a shot to go to a different part of the country i wanted to prove that one i could get results at a at a high major level but two that i could coach athletes from a different part of the country because even though we had you know different players and at bu i worked with men's soccer as well so i had the european connection as well but i wanted to go to a different part of the country and see if that would have you know impacted my coaching in any way and, you know, I'm grateful for the time at ECU. Um, you know, uh, Coach Connors what, Coach Connors stepped away a year and a half ago. And then Coach, William, Coach John Williams came along and he was, he's, been, he's been a great person um, to work with for the, for the last year and a half that I had at ECU. And then Coach Dooley was hired as well. But, you know, I think another part of me was like, you know, I, I needed a, another change. I needed another challenge and you know, Coach Lanier has been awesome. This, you know, you know, I'm a city guy, so I think it's it also helps to be back in the city again. But Coach Lanier and the staff here are phenomenal. The kids are great, and you know, it's I've I've been lucky enough to have to have three different spots in three different parts of the country, and work for some really cool coaches and work with some really cool young men and women. And you know, I I don't think there's I I definitely wish that I didn't feel the need that I had to prove myself at that age because I was 27, but it taught me a lot. Um, you know, it, it, it definitely challenged me to be in different parts of the country and work with, di- work with different types of people. But looking back on it, I wouldn't change, change a thing in terms of, you know, going to a different, I do think that's something that every coach should do, not from a, you got to prove yourself, but, you know, if you're from Georgia and all you know is Georgia, I do think it's beneficial to go to a different part of the country and see how other people operate, um, see how other coaches do things, see how other men and women act, talk, so that you can be a more well-rounded coach. You know, Vinny, I think that I'm going to jump back a little bit 
and I didn't think this was the direction we were going to go, bro. But I think that this is cool. You know, like we all, we all like talking about finances right now, right? A lot of coaches are talking about how we can be better and how we can do better for ourselves by taking care of things externally money wise. And, you know, being a guy that was in finance, I think when you were talking about your education system, I think it's, um, I think, or your education and your path. I think it's really like Wu Tang Financial, man. You know, like that old Chappelle show skit where mm-hmm. you just got to diversify. Mm-hmm. And I think your diversity in your education is what is something. And I, first of all, going back, I don't, if you're a young coach, you may not recognize those names that he just said. Uh, hit pause, go to the Google, and start with Rodriguez because. She's she's a gun. Like it's she's a funny an story. Stud. I hope she listens to this because there's a funny story. This was probably my second day or third day, and I'll never forget it. I was standing when you walk into Boyles. There's a Vertimax from like 1750 that he's that I don't know if it's still there, but at that time it was only for guys who were injured um, that needed a modification. And I had my hands. I, I either had my hands in my pocket or my hands were crossed and she's big in do in into like posture and, and how it looks. So I'm standing there and, you know, watching uh, the kid lift and she comes by and, and Nicole is a fiery five, three woman who's very passionate, you know, very knowledgeble. And she just taps me on the side of the leg and she's like, Hey man, go ahead, you can go home. I said, it is like three o'clock. I'm like, let's just start. He's like, nah, you're not, you're not engaged. Like she ripped me a new one and that right there. And ever since then, I still use some of the things like, you know, make sure you have a stopwatch. And, you know, I tell some of my guys that some of the interns I've worked with that, you know, you always want to look engaged. Cause if you're like this, that means you don't want to be here. If your hands are in your pocket, then you're dis- disinterested. If anything, hands behind your back is in a, in a, an attendant stance or you have your stopwatch and you, you know, you pretend like you're timing something or whatever, or, or, or you're counting. But she like, that was like my second, third day. She lit a fire under me. And I'm like, she brought me to that coach's mentality. And then I got chewed out even more by um, coach Miranda and coach Boyle, because they had heard about it. And they were like, we stuck out on the leg for you, but now coach Nicole, she is definitely someone that if you're young, like you want to look up her and all the other names as well. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. But then you go from from there down to Coach Connors. So you've had the the opportunity to learn from a lot of people who. Um, I don't think Jeff gets the credit that he deserves, and I don't think Michael ever get enough credit mm-hmm. for everything he's done. I think that all too often, like we were talking about earlier, people look at Mike too like bioptically, right? And it's like. I don't think that they understand that his willingness to flip flop and say that he disagrees with what he used to do. Um, I don't think people understand the power of that and how much that needs to impact them in how they look at what they do. Uh, Another talk for another day though, but both of them really, I like paved the way for all of us. A lot of us. Yeah. Yeah, I mean like early nineties, early nineties, late Mm eighties when you know, if you were a strength coach, you were also the athletic trainer. Or you were one strength coach for 26 teams. And nowadays, that, that would be seen as, oh, I'm not doing that. They were doing that. Like Mike like Mike would tell you, he was the strength coach for BU training 26 teams. And he was a bartender at one of the places because his BU salary was probably like 18, 20 grand. And he had to find a way to make money. You know, and you talk about that now. This, this coach is... And like now, I do believe financially things have not changed in the most optimal way, personally, because when you talk about what the average income was in the early 90s when it came to a strength coach to the average income now, and you're talking cost of living and all these external factors, do I think a head strength coach should be making 40 grand? No. Do I think someone with five six years of experience should be making 50 grand probably not especially when you have a bachelor's and a master's degree and you have all the experience but you got to find a way to figure it out and those guys at least 
made it so 20 years later there's they went from having 200 strength coach jobs to I don't know how many hundreds that you could think of at the division one, two, three level, high school level, private sector. Like they did create a whole industry that it was a lot harder for them than it is for us. Yeah, no doubt. As we talk about this idea of diversifying your education, this has led you down some different paths as well. You know, it hasn't just been Vinny, from what the time was at MBSNC and his time at uh, East Carolina, but also going out and digging and finding things of different areas when we're talking like the foot and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, I've been lucky enough. You talk about some of the coaches that I've worked with. You got Mike's, Mike's philosophy and everyone, t- you know, one of the biggest things he's known for is that unilateral work, but still like his philosophy. And then I worked for, I interned for Coach Hogan's, who taught me the conjugate method. Then I worked for Coach Harris, who really got me to delve into triphasic and really understanding that. And then Connors kind of has his own philosophy and periodization scheme. And then I, before I left uh, ECU, I got to work with Coach Williams, who's an EDT guy. So I've been able to learn and that, and, and that, and that's what I think like, it's so cool to kind of jump around to different places because you can learn so much different philosophies and methodologies. Like I had one of the things like obviously with, with coach Boyle and, you know, there's um, perform better and all that, but we talk about Greg cook and the FMS and all that stuff. And, I was big into that because that's what I started with. Well, recently, uh, and this is what, like, working with basketball, I always kind of, first off, disclaimer, I hate feet. I think it's disgusting, but it's what we have to work with, right, on a regular basis. So I started to learn more and more about, you know, how the foot operates and all the, all the essential keys about how it moves and everything that, that goes entailed with it. But one thing that was, that, you know, always stuck in my head when Mike first started, one of the few quotes was you always want to keep learning, right? Even you always want to, even if you don't understand it or if you don't get it, it's not that it doesn't work, but you have to be able to learn about it. And then you decipher whether or not you want to make it a part of what, what you believe it or not. So I went into AFS and I said, you know what? I know it's two different types of, ideologies when it comes to AFS and when it comes to the FMS and how they kind of operate and how you move. But some of the stuff from the AFS, I don't understand it, but I want to learn about it a little bit more and got into Gary Gray's work. And there are, you know, some really good things that I like, and then there's some things that I don't like, but my point of it is, I think sometimes we say we don't like something or we, or we don't agree with someone's philosophy. And I don't think we truly understand what it is that they're doing. I just think it's different than what we do and what we've learned. And that's okay. But to truly say, hey, you know, I don't agree with what they're doing. You should have an understanding. Like I should know if, I, if I'm going to have an argument with somebody about um, hit training and I don't do hit training or whatever, I should understand what are the pros and the cons from hit training compared to what I do. And does it have a place in what I do? Or is it something that I believe in? If I'm just going to say, hey, I don't like hit training. I don't like German volume training. I don't like EDT. I don't like conjugate. Is it because I understand it and I don't believe in it? Or is it because I don't understand it and I don't care to learn about it because it's nothing, it's something that I'm not, that I don't believe in. And I think some, I think as a profession, we tend to go with the side of, I don't know what it's about and it's not what I do. So I'm not going to learn about it. I think that that analogy can be carried over to so many different things right now, too. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, yeah, like every dang thing that's going on in this insane country that we live in right now. 
But that, my friend, is going to need a talk where we're at some brewery drinking something really good. Probably not at this hour. Uh, oh. And and that'll yeah, probably get a little five days. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, <laughs> no doubt. Uh, for those of you who aren't paying attention, I, I happened to con Vinny into being part of the seventy five hard program with us, and uh, you know it's it's fun, and you know so glad that you could be part of that. But dude, this is some killer stuff, and it's what's most important here, Van, is this is thirty minutes that are going to make people take a step back and think. And so. kind of reevaluate some things. So I know too that you're super active. Well, not super active, but you're, I would say this, you are very positively active on social media, which is not something I would say about a lot of people, but you're very positively active on social media. So where can people follow you, keep up with you, see what you're doing? Also great pictures daily of the dogs, like, I think that that's probably what I like more than anything on Instagram now is dog pictures and videos, <laughs> but you know, that's just, I'm a weirdo, right. but yeah. Where can people follow you, keep up with you and all that stuff, bro. So, uh, I think, I, I, think, I think my handle is on both. I think it's just both coach underscore Kaluti on both. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but it's actually crazy. Cause you know, you talk about when we started coaches weren't supposed to be on social media and now it's like, hey, you need to be on social media. And I, I, I definitely think, you know, I'm still learning about it. I think a lot of my views are more trying to be positive and trying to make sure people are doing things right. But I definitely, you know, I'm not one to fight, if, you know, for, for exercise, for programming. I work on it. You know, I always think it's hard just because, I don't know, I, I'm not, it's not a second nature for me to be on my phone and record something and do it. But it's definitely something that everybody tells me, like, man, with all the stuff, all the different type of training methodologies that you do and how you incorporate everything. I do got to get better at putting things down, but that'll come. I promise the viewers that's, that's something that I'm working on. I'm trying to do, but yeah, coach underscore Kaluti, I think on Twitter and Instagram, I don't even know if my Facebook still works anymore, but I think I have, I have Facebook. I'm not even sure. You know what? And let me, let me take an opportunity for this, for you young coaches out there looking to intern. You've got a guy that's learned from, some of the pioneers and the best of the best come help them out. You want to learn, trade them to use the camera, trade them for some time to video. So you can help all of us understand what Ben's doing down there better too. Like that's a big scratch mine, scratch yours right there, man. You know, like being able to learn all that and, and help out. Cause dude, like I I've tried and it's like, it's impossible. Like, I, I get so frustrated trying to do it. I mean, I'm old, I'm gray. I, I, I just figured out I how just to throw do, my uh... phone. I just figured out how to do, uh, how to re, I don't know, retweet. Like, if someone tags you in something and you want to put it on your story, like how, like me and you do it, I literally yeah. just figured out how to do that, like probably like yeah. six months ago. Yeah. And I'm and and I'm thirty one. I'm thirty one years old, and I still. So like, there's a lot of stuff that I just don't get. My wife's laughing at me because she's like, she knows when it comes to this <laughs> stuff, I'm an idiot. But. <laughs> But oh, like, man, like to me, that's to me, that's the big thing. But yeah, man, any any interns? I mean, if you're in the Atlanta area, you want to come by. That's something that you know myself and Coach Melhorn are always looking at. We uh, we got two this year. Um, I, you know, to me, I think that's it holds a very special place for me because I didn't have a graduate program. You know, I just interned and I put everything I could into being the best intern possible and learning as much as I could. And, to me, that's a really phenomenal way to break into the industry. And I think if you're a veteran coach, and I don't consider myself one, but I think if you have a position where you can bring people in and teach, you know, I think that's, you know, just as much as part of our job as it is to educate and increase, you know, our athletes' performance and their personal well-being. That's awesome, man. I love it. Listen, brother, this is sensational. I can't thank you enough for your time, buddy. We will be in touch real soon, man. Definitely, man. Appreciate you. Yeah, man. Cheers.